Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, my name is Salma Avdich with the American Marketing Association, and I will be your moderator for today's webcast. Our webcast is in partnership with ReadyTalk, and it's titled, Why Marketers Should Have a Seat at the Crisis Communications Table. Okay, so before we officially start, I do want to cover these important housekeeping items. So our session is being recorded today and will be made available to you on ama.org slash webcast after uh, the webcast is uh, over. We also encourage you all to continue this conversation on Twitter, and you can do so by referencing hashtag ReadyTalk. And if you have any technical or content-related questions, please feel free to ask them at any point. You can use our uh, chat area, which is located on the left-hand side of your screen. All right, so with that, I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker. So we have Conroy Boxhill, who's the CEO at Gladiator RMS uh, with us. And before I pass it over to Conroy, I do want to share a little bit about him. So prior to embarking on his own venture, Conroy was an executive vice president of corporate crisis reputation management for Edelman in Atlanta. And he has nearly 20 years of experience in managing corporate reputation, executive visibility, and crisis and issues management programs for Fortune 500 companies. I also have to mention that he is a board member of Chris Kids, which is a nonprofit profit organization which provides counseling, support, and services to abused and neglected foster care youth in Metro Atlanta. So, Conroy, it is wonderful to have you with us. I will turn it over to you now to officially get us started. Excellent. Thank you, Selma. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to join us. I'm really excited to spend some time with you today and share information that I think is critical about why marketers should have a seat at the crisis communications table. I've spent the better part of uh, 10 years of, the, of my career really focused on crisis communication, and it's been really exciting to see the transformation that the communications landscape has gone through, particularly with the, emerging, the emergence of smart devices um, and the fact that people are much more connected and involved um, than ever before. So things that typically were isolated uh, can be brought to the forefront much more quickly. And, and as a result, brands are a lot more are being held even more uh, accountable than they were before. So today, we're going to spend some time talking about some of the, the crisis management uh, trends that we see, that I've seen, particularly in the last 12 to 18 months, and, and what some of those implications are for marketers, some things for you to keep top of mind. I want to talk about how risk management needs to be embedded into how you think about your marketing campaigns. Uh, there is real opportunity, as you'll hear from me later, for marketers to be a, an important partner to the organization from a reputation and crisis management perspective. And I believe marketers can do it both proactively and in moments of crisis. We're going to talk through some examples and ways that I see that marketers can be more proactive in that regard. And then we're going to talk about what happens when the house is on fire. What do you do then? Uh, if you're sitting in marketing and historically you've just kind of kicked the can over to PR or to the CorpCom team, um, what do you do? And then throughout, we're going to share, I'm going to share some case studies, things that we're seeing in the, in the current uh, landscape that are instructive to, uh, I believe, all professionals in the communications field to help both kind of protect brands and, and be in a position to use their, um, the, the marketing arm as an important part of that. So let's jump right in. So what's going on in the landscape? If you were to turn on your television this morning, uh, you know, if you like GMA or 
if your favorite is the Today Show, or if you're watching your local news. But regardless of whatever it is, uh, there are several issues that are just top of mind for brands because they have the potential to grab a hold of them whether or not the brand is expecting it or not. Um, when you consider uh, where we are uh, nationally discussing things like um, immigration policy and how emotionally charged a topic like that is, uh, you wouldn't consider that to be something that brands need to be concerned about. But obviously with the population of the United States growing increasingly diverse, the employee base of many companies um, reflect many nationalities. And so you've got employee, employers feeling compelled uh, to take a position. Uh, you see that in uh, companies that are dealing with uh, issues such as the religious uh, freedom bills that have popped up all across the United States. Um, you've got companies, corporations feeling compelled to come out and take a voice. Uh, you look at what's happening with the various movements from everything from the Me Too movement to um, the anti-gun violence movement for young people. And you see that uh, more than anything, what's happening in the world right now is that there is um, a, a real business opportunity with managing risk. As you can see from some of the stats that I'm sharing here, um, the importance of reputation risk and management you know, has made its way to the boardroom. It's no longer just uh, for the functional roles to consider. There's real financial value for organizations to consider how they use all their assets available to them to manage reputation risk because it has a real dollar value for companies. Uh, as you see here, you know, 82% of companies are making substantial effort to do that. And when I read that statistic, what that told me was that it's important for marketers to pay attention to reputation management as part of the asset of the organization because in many ways that is how um, those in the C-suite think about reputation. And so marketers equal, have an equal responsibility, I believe, along with communications professionals, PR folks, to protect reputation at all costs. One of the things that I observe happening that marketers really need to pay attention to, and they have, I believe, from a proactive standpoint, but not necessarily from a reactive standpoint, is this idea of the inversion of influence. So seven, ten years ago, the old model was you've got a small group of people who sit at the top of the pyramid who are truly the influencers. They're the elite, and they have access uh, because they're elite, because they're educated, because of whatever their socioeconomic situation is. They have access to information that the, what you would call the, the broad and the mass population does not. But in some ways, it's not completely, a, it was not com considered completely a big deal because there, were, there was a, at least a perception that the interests of the elite and those of um, the masses were interconnected in some way. Well, what you see is a flip of that where we're operating in a very different reality where it's not the small elite um, that are at the top of the pyramid anymore. It's flipped over and we have a situation where the, the, the mass population, the everyday man, is, is wielding much more of the power um, in society because there's the opportunity to force accountability. And so what you have is um, an increasing amount of distrust, right? People are, are calling um, brands, organizations, individuals to the carpet um, when they perceive them as not living up to uh, what their values are, what they espouse to be. And so you see these mass movements happening, like with gun control, um, similar to the Me Too movement, uh, for the equality and race issues um, that Black Lives Movement is, is pushing. You see much more of that kind of 
um, um, populist movement uh, that's happening because technology and and the access to it uh, is really propelling the uh, uh, greater conversation amongst people. So what does this inversion of influence mean for marketers, and, and why should you care? Let's start with a couple of case studies. Uh, you may or may not have seen in the news uh, around Starbucks issues where uh, two African-American men walk into a Starbucks in, Philip in, in a uh, local Philadelphia store, and as they were sitting there, apparently for a few minutes, uh, one of the employees of the store uh, proceeded to ask them to either purchase an item from the store or ask them to leave. When the gentleman refused to do that, uh, they, the police were called. Um, I suspect this type of incident has happened in thousands of retail incidents all over the country. Uh, this was not the first and certainly wouldn't be the last. What's unique in the situation is the idea some, you know, we have, we're in the cell phone ger um, generation. We have citizen journalists who were there on the spot, and we see this all the time, recording that. And so here we have a situation where a cell phone video shared on social media makes the full circle and results in massive protests at the store and a real kind of uh, public relations nightmare for the brand. And it speaks to this idea of in a moment's notice, through a tweet, through a post on um, uh, YouTube, uh, or shared online, on, through Instagram, a, a brand can be in real trouble. And the reason that's particularly important for marketers is chances are because marketers own the social channels and are regularly engaging with stakeholders, marketers are likely the first to spot it. Um, certainly corporate communications have, uh, in my experience, they have tools that they use to try to keep a pulse on kind of stakeholder perceptions, but marketers are in the trenches engaging uh, with these individuals every day. And so I suspect uh, very early on, the folks at Starbucks in, the, uh, in, their, in their social media department, um, as well as their agencies, um, saw things light up uh, on their channels um, when that occurred. And so um, what that tells you is it was no longer enough for uh, Starbucks to issue a corporate apology. What ended up happening because of the inversion of influence uh, is that the brand was compelled to roll out a much broader program. And so from a marketing perspective, um, the ability for marketing to be able to spot those types of things on the horizon uh, is critically important for an organization, particularly in, the, in, in, in this area of inver in, inverse influence. And then another case study that I want to talk through is the, the recent issue around, um, around gun violence, which is another uh, important uh, point of discussion, not just for uh, folks in that are selling or manufacturing gun-related products, but for retail outlets. So uh, REI, which is a, a major uh, outdoor uh, store, a store that sells, pardon me, outdoor products, decided that it was no longer carry the products for a company called Vista Outdoors which is a major uh, outdoor gear company based in Salt Lake, um, Utah. But in addition to carrying a number of retail products, you know, they make a number of gun-related products, um, whether it be ammunition or um, other related products. And if you have an opportunity to look at the story, one of the things that's interesting is there's a, a REI member who really catapulted this movement resulting in the company actually taking action. Uh, and it started as an online petition. And very quickly, this person was able to kind of mobilize uh, a larger subset of REI members who shared this perspective that um, this brand needed to uh, 
this this brand was not reflective of the values that they thought REI as a brand should carry, and so they were going to be very vocal about making about um, un, unless have, unless Vista took a stand publicly that they were going to try to boycott the brand. Now, here you have a, a situation where the brand itself wasn't engaged in any kind of crisis per se, but because of one of its suppliers, it finds itself in a really challenging situation from a reputation perspective, and then forced to make a business decision and communicate it publicly. And so that speaks to the power of what the mass is now capable of doing, of forcing corporations to take action. And so with that in mind, um, it's really important for marketers to pay attention. So what do you do? What, what can you do? So start by just asking some questions. You know, I, I have a, a, quite a few friends that are marketers, and they're some of the most creative people I know. I have great respect for them, particularly because I believe marketing, um, more than any of the disciplines in communications, has really uh, really use the data in a, in a truly powerful um, and instructive way uh, to drive campaigns. But when you think about reputation more broadly, and, and in my experience at least, you know, most marketers consider reputation primarily through the lens of how does it help me to sell more stuff, right? But increasingly, it's how do you use <clears throat> data to drive greater engagement, so when you think about reputation management and crisis management as a marketer, the, question, the questions that need to immediately come to mind is, what role does marketing as a function versus PR play in crisis management for your organization? Do you, do you understand what the philosophy is? Are you part of the cross-functional team that is responsible for that? And if you currently aren't, I would really suggest that you do that um, because I think that there's a real value both for you and the organizations from having uh, marketing at the table. Um, if you're a marketer who is using, obviously, social media on a regular basis to drive engagement, have you sat thoughtfully, pardon me, have you actually thought about what the greatest pain points are for those people that you're engaging? So, whether it be um, I have a community that really um, respects and values responsiveness. Um, I have a community that um, expects me to take responsibility and accountability. I have a community that has, draws a line across certain things because that would be unacceptable to them. Really understanding um, where the things are from a, your relationship with your stakeholders and, and what, what things are non-negotiable are really important for overall um, reputation management. And marketers, I believe, have the best opportunity to provide that intel because of the level of engagement um, and the constant um, communication that's happening with, with an organization stakeholders. Um, the next thing you need to ask yourself is, when you are putting together a campaign, have you applied any kind of um, risk assessment to what it is that you, you as a marketer and that program that you and your team have gone through and thought about and really believe can drive engagement for the brand? Have you considered the other side? Have you flipped the coin to consider what if things were to go wrong? What could be potentially a landmine that we're stepping on? Are you inviting the Corpcom or the crisis person uh, on your team to review uh, your campaigns before you launch them? I suspect that if brands like Dove, when they uh, end up in the unfortunate uh, problem of defending some of their choices around the uh, the, the shape of some of the products that they, they, um, that they issued to, um, to H&M. I lost my, my train of thought there for a second. To H&M. And how, who could forget that one? Now, I don't know if you guys saw this in the news 
Um, but H&M, probably about four months ago, had a situation where they launched um, a, a T-shirt and, uh, excuse me, a sweatshirt and uh, as part of their, I think, fall clothing line. And unfortunately, one of in the campaign, there was a young African-American boy who was wearing a sweatshirt um, with some language on the front of it that um, was to be considered insensitive. Now, one could argue that, um, you know, you would wonder, you know, who's sitting at that table with the marketing team as they're, as they're having the conversation about this campaign and looking at the various creatives uh, that have been selected uh, to help promote the products. And, and you wonder, did anyone consider and say, what's the cultural context that we're living in right now? Um, there's a lot of conversation around race in a, in, a, in a relatively unpleasant way happening in the country right now. It's probably not a good idea for this to be um, what we, the, the imagery we use. And so a bit of an extreme but an important example for all of you that if you are launching a campaign and you are not having someone that is a non-marketer that has a bit of a risk management perspective to really ask the questions around where the vulnerabilities are in the campaign that you're about to launch, you're doing yourself and the organization a tremendous disservice. And finally, um, as a marketer, are there things that are vulnerabilities for the organization that as part of your campaigns you can help solve? Um, it's one of the fastest ways for you to, 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 to get a, a, a strategic seat at the table is to demonstrate not only um, what you can do to promote, but also where you can help to protect. So from a protection perspective, one of the things that you need to understand if, if you haven't seen the crisis plan for your organization, if there's not one, um, you need to get one quickly. But one of the things I always talk to clients about is you can't react to every matter the same way from a reputation perspective. So within your organization, you need some kind of um, escalation model that tells you when a problem is becoming increasingly more serious. So what I've shared is one that I use often with my clients. It's, it's the equivalent of the stoplight um, plus one, where there are things that will happen for brands that matters of where there's a reputation issue, where there are more serious than others, and so as a result require a different response from the organization. And so one of the things that I want to encourage you to do as marketers is even in, whether it be in your social media engagement um, or whether you're thinking about um, potential things that could happen and how you would respond um, through uh, the, the uh, uh, direct um, engagement with, with folks that may be unhappy about an action you've taken or something you've said, is to understand what level of threat does that problem Opposed to the reputation of the organization. And it, it, it would be an important thing for marketers to align yourselves with perhaps what CorpCom has, so you're, you're singing from the same songbook. But if you don't, this is something that you can create yourself. So when is it um, a level one where you're just watching something? You know, something has emerged, but it, it doesn't require a response right away. So you're kind of just watching it. So to, the, to level two where, you know what, um, the organization um, has some risks because, you know, it's, it's tangentially touching the organization in some way, the brand. So, for example, let's say you're a retail brand and um, you're one of those – let's say you're a, a, a food retailer and there is a major shooting in a parking lot. And the news camera comes out, and they use your brand's logo as the 
kind of the, the, the reference point for the story. So the shooting did not occur in your parking lot. It didn't occur at the store. But the news report might just reference the store location as that reference point. And all of a sudden, um, it's being picked up in relation to this crime. So in that very indirect way, here you have as a marketer, you're, you're out there engaging with um, your folks on, on social media, and chances are it's going to pop up that, hey, such and such happened at your location. Um, that's a situation where you may be aware, but you may choose not to, to engage. And then as you get more progressively serious, you have situations where now your brand at a level three, for instance, is being scrutinized um, by key stakeholders, and it would require a response. So if you're seeing that and you're watching your social media channels and you see that stakeholders are talking about and requesting information, there's going to be a point where you have to respond. And so that's the point where you determine is it within your, um, in terms of the rules of engagement, is this something that marketing goes alone, or is it something that's worth bringing Corpcom in? The idea behind suggesting you develop these kind of threat levels is to help you make those kinds of decisions. It's to figure out when something is serious enough to either expand the scope of who is involved and bring in more resources or to just observe and not inadvertently um, deploy your resources. So how do you respond? Well, what I can tell you is, <laughs> in my experience, most people, uh, most organizations go through this very same cycle. Something's happened, someone gets a phone call, or they read a Google alert, or they're watching the morning news, and, they're, and, they, and, the, and the brand's name is mentioned. Oh, my God, what's happening? What's going on? Uh, you know, I, I just, I, I can't believe. You know, it, they, they go through these kind of seven or eight stages where it's just absolute panic. And what I want to encourage you to do if you're a marketer is, listen, don't panic. There are some just fundamental questions that you really need to understand by putting on a crisis management lens, and it will really help you determine how to respond or how to think about what threat level it is uh, per the, the earlier slides I shared. So what happened? You know, what, what, what does the situation entail? What are the facts, the who, the what, the where, the when? Right? Who's affected? How are they affected? You know, try to get as much of that information as you can um, so that you understand really what are going to be the expectations of the brand in terms of response and engagement. And, and that's where I think marketers can use the vast amounts of data that they have to say, okay, when something happens, how much of a trend is this because we've got historical engagement data um, how can we really help the organization determine um, through our own experience whether this is something worth uh, responding to or not? When you consider um, the incident and what has, what has occurred, the next thing for you to think through is, okay, who, get, who do I get involved? How quickly do I get involved? And how soon am I expected to respond? And oftentimes that's something that if you do well, you can turn what is a painful moment into a triumph, triumphant moment. Let's take, for example, KFC. So I want to tell you guys, um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with this case study or not, but it's fascinating. So KFC had a new provider, for, uh, uh, excuse me, um, uh, what do you call that? The, the supply, supply, uh, a supplier for their, to move their, um, their chickens, right, to get it from, transport their chickens. So I was like, uh, I couldn't get that right. But, you know, the guys who bring them the, 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 the chicken that we all go in and buy, right? So KFC takes on a new, um, a new provider, and 
unfortunately, these guys are not up for the task. So you've got chicken piled up on the side of the road, and this happened in the U.K., by the way, um, this particular incident. So chicken is piled up everywhere. You know, stores are closed down across the, 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 in the London market because I can't get chicken. There's no, there's no food to cook. So it becomes a crisis um, for the brands because you've got, unfortunately, people who are um, uh, on television complaining profusely that they can't get their bucket of chicken. And that's a real problem for them. It was so much of a problem that they started calling the police, which is the reason I included this very fascinating tweet um, from the local police department imploring local citizens to stop calling them about the KFC uh, shutting down. I mean, the brand couldn't be in a more painful and vulnerable position. But it wasn't corporate communications that turned around this moment for the brand. It was the CMO and her marketing agency. They took out a full-page ad in the, in, the two local paper, in the two main papers with a, a very simple apology, but more importantly, a clever play on words, excuse me, play on um, a, a reassortment of their logo. And what was so clever about this marketing move was not only did the brand issue, an, issue the apology to acknowledge that they had had some issues, obviously, with service, but they did it so cleverly by, and by t- being able to tie the apology to the brand in such a clever way that the, the, the apology itself silenced the criticism. It became the conversation and redirected the crisis for the brand. So I thought it was just a really brilliant way to demonstrate that marketers don't have to sit on the sidelines because you understand the voice of the brand. You understand kind of the, the cultural context that the brand is operating in. And so there are opportunities in moments where there are real business challenges where marketing has the opportunity to turn things around. And I thought this was a great example to share with you all um, of how marketing team uh, did, it, did it really well. So if you don't have a, 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 a great idea around how to flip your logo around or the words in your logo, if that's not an option, then there's just a good old tried and true process that um, if you are not working with your Qualcomm team and if you don't have a Qualcomm team and you're, you're, you're a marketing department, of two or three or five or whatever it is, or you're a single marketer and you're thinking through, what do I do if a crisis occurs? I would just urge you to take these, 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 um, these steps. So start with just getting the facts, the who, the what, the when, the where. Understand what, what's happening here and think through, who do I need to notify? If you're, if you're a partner with Corpcom, you've got to know, do I need to flag for them? Do I need to flag something to operations? You know, think through, after gathering the facts, who do you need to notify um, to be able to get the information you need to determine how you respond? You know, what's going to be your response strategy? And so making sure that you get the, the right decision makers at the table um, is important so that you have a holistic perspective of how do you respond to this situation that has emerged. And then from there, you're prepared to communicate. What are the materials that you're going to need? Um, are you going to issue a tweet? Is it going to be um, how do you respond to people who are on your brand page on other social channels like Instagram or Facebook? Um, are you going to have the conversation on your wall? Or are you going to take it private? You know, have those things because that's, marketers are, are responsible for those channels. So understanding what materials, what, how do you need the messaging to be, and the content to be packaged uh, in order to maintain the voice of the, the brand is really important. And, and then last but not least is, is to just communicate. Um, make sure that you're monitoring the response so that you can adjust how you continue to communicate. 
and engage with stakeholders as needed. And then finally, once you get through the moment, you know, just don't take a breath and keep going. Really take the time to evaluate and analyze what you did wrong, what you did well, and what you can learn from it moving forward. So, some best practices for you to consider. Be proactive, okay? Um, as a marketer, there's an opportunity for you to use your engage the pulse that you get from engaging with stakeholders through the various social media channels, um, or as well as offline if you're doing offline activations um, as a marketer, really pay close attention to what is the expectation of your stakeholders and how are they shifting over time. Be proactive in understanding what the pain points are for the brand and what you can do as a marketing team or a marketing department um, to help with that. Um, I won't go through all the points on this slide, but a couple I'll point out is when something goes wrong as a marketer, one of the, the, the core things you need to think through is how do you empathize with the affected communities? Whether or not you may necessarily agree fully is not the point. The point is the, as, as much as Corpcom and, and the C-suite will would, would lead on messaging, marketers have an opportunity to really demonstrate the empathy in a way that shows up um, authentically uh, in social channels. And that's really important for, um, for the brand, both in the short term and in the long term. Um, last but not least, if something happens and you're aware of it and you've investigated it, it's important to take responsibility. Um, there's nothing worse for a brand than to be perceived as trying to escape its responsibility. And so marketers need to understand what does that look like for your brand? How does that, sh how does that manifest in the way you, in the content that you share um, in moments of crisis and in, mo and, and in the, the moments immediately after? So to summarize quickly, you know, if you are listening to this webinar today and you're considering what are the two to three things that I need to think about to make sure that as a marketer I can be really helpful to my organization both before a crisis happens and when it's happening, I would offer you these three. Number one, <clears throat> establish yourself as a function within the organization as a credible source of um, early warnings of things that may not be immediately in, um, urgent or burning, but are things that the organization needs to watch. You have an incredible opportunity to serve as, a, as kind of a, a window to the organization by holding up um, that mirror and, and, and showing from the outside in what are those opportunities, what are those risks, um, because you inherently have access to them as part of your engagement with stakeholders um, on behalf of the brand. So that's number one. Number two, recognize that more than anything, content is king. Marketers are the primary um, uh, developers of content for brands. And in moments of crisis, content matters still. And so the ability to take whatever the message is that the organization is using in response to a crisis, but packaging it in a way that is authentic to the brand is something that marketers, <clears throat> pardon me, are uniquely positioned to do well and should be at the table to help do well. And then the third and final thing would be to, to <clears throat> excuse me, keep it simple. So if you are thinking through your crisis response and how you help your organization respond in one of those cycles they're going through when everyone is panicking because <clears throat> something has happened at the store level, 
Um, it's now gotten uh, it's it's emerged on social media as a problem. The news cameras are showing up at your store, and so you're thinking, I have to do something really elaborate in order to demonstrate that I'm I'm taking action, and that couldn't be further from the case. I think one of the great opportunities that exist for crisis management is to leverage social media and the third the third party allies that you build with folks over time the relationships you build with over time to help you in a crisis and marketers are by their very nature relationship builders and so in moments of crisis um marketers can help brands keep it simple in their communications on channels where uh, corporate communications may be more inclined to, um, to take a different approach to whether it be messaging or, or how they share content, and marketers can, can really help them understand how to be authentic with sharing that. So uh, with that said, I, I, I really believe that if you're not at the table, your company is wasting a lot of talent. Marketers understand data, they understand the engagement. Um, as a corporate communications and crisis guy, I have deep appreciation and respect for the value that they bring. And so I would urge you to not just ask for a seat at the crisis management table, demand it, and, and pull it up and get to work because the brand the organizations that you work for, they need your expertise. So with that, I will um, happy to take any questions that you may have. Um, really hope that you found the information that I shared with you today to be helpful. And um, thanks again for your time. And Selma, um, I'll, say, I'll turn it over to you, yeah. I guess, from here. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Kadroy. We... Do you have a little bit of time for questions? So I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, so we have Kayla here uh, who wants to know, you know, when a crisis occurs, who should own the decision-making about how a brand uh, responds in a crisis? Excellent question. Thanks for that, Kayla. You know, in that instance, I think it depends on where the source of the crisis comes from. So um, in, in many ways, if it's, a, if it's a situation where it is operations driven, like in the instance of the uh, KFC case study that I shared with the group earlier, I talk about how marketing grabbed it and responded because it was – in that instance, it made sense for marketing to own versus corporate communications because the the failure to deliver the product uh, was so visible that the scale of the response needed to match. And that's one of the powerful things that marketing offers over communications from a, a channels and a reach perspective. And so you know, my advice to brands is if it's a situation that is somewhat contained that uh, can be dealt with through just media relations and engagement and doesn't require a major social push, then corporate communication should lead. But if it's a situation like KFC face, I do believe that marketing absolutely should lead on that because you need the ability to reach and engage with a really broad set of stakeholders uh, in a really short amount of time. Great. Thank you so much for that response. Okay, so we have Ben here who is curious about what new techniques uh, should marketers learn to become more proficient in crisis management? Great question, Ben. Uh, you know, three things I would offer you, Ben, to think about that I believe would really help you, uh, help market it yourself and market it in general. I think the first, um, first thing is just having a, um, <clears throat> a deeper understanding of the cultural context. So how are you as a marketer, not just thinking about from the promote side of things, what you need to know from your, about your stakeholders, 
but understanding from a, if you had to defend yourself, what are the things that culturally um, you need to understand and use to inform how you engage. So um, making sure that you are up to speed on the latest consumer insights around and, and behavioral trends um, and, and, the, and, and things like that are really important to help you inform how you respond. Um, so that would be one. Number two, would, I would say, is how to think about uh, kind of paid media and online reputation in much more proactive ways. Um, really understanding that you can be um, much more intentional about who you curate your reputation with, not just for the sake of driving sales, but for the sake of building reputation equity. So really understanding how you use your campaigns in particular paid media to build reputation reserve for yourself I think is an important thing. And the third and final thing um, that I would say, Ben, is understanding um, how to better do risk assessments um, not just on your major campaigns, but just your overall engagement posture. Really, on a, on, a, on a routine basis, bringing to the table people that are not a part of your team on a regular basis to ask questions about why are you doing things the way you're doing them and how can you be doing them differently. So bringing that outside perspective in. So, Ben, hopefully that's helpful to you, man. Wonderful. Thank you, Conroy. Uh, we do have a follow-up to your, uh, you had just made a point about paid media. Um, and so we, we have Lauren here who just wanted a little bit more information, a little bit more specifics on ro what role, um, excuse me, what role should paid media play in a crisis response? If you can give some specifics around that. Absolutely. So one of the great things that paid media has allowed brands to do is to almost draw um, um, nets around specific demographics um, of people, um, whether based on geography or, or, or any other or, or measures like that. Um, I remember a particular situation where um, I had a, a client that was going through a very difficult and nasty negotiation with a partner um, on a deal. And um, that, in, uh, as a result of the deal or, or the inability to, to um, come to terms on the deal, my client was losing um, hundreds of thousands of dollars daily. And so they wanted to find a way to... to help convince this partner why it would be a good idea to move more quickly on the contract. And so one of the things that that client asked me to do with my team and in partnership with their marketing team was to develop a series, uh, develop a, uh, a package of content that really told the story of how our partner's inability to come to the table and get this deal done was really impacting the public in a very meaningful way. Um, but not just anyone in the public, people who we knew would be, will feel compelled to reach out to their local congressman, uh, their local elected official, um, to raise the noise around why it was important to get this deal going and we were able to use paid media because we didn't want to draw attention from the broader customer base in this. We want to be really focused. And so understanding um, that we were able to use a kind of click-to-call Google campaign to drive phone calls to important people that we wanted to let know that people were outraged that this deal wasn't done, uh, because we knew that would apply pressure and, and, and try to hopefully compel um, our partner to be a little more amicable in, in the negotiation process. 
and it worked. And so my, my point is being able to take, whether it be on, um, whether it be on LinkedIn for a B2B campaign or on Facebook for a more consumer-facing campaign uh, or, or, or on Instagram because it's, it's, more vi- you know, it's more visual, whatever it is that you need, when you need to think through how can I use paid media to be hyper-specific spe- and getting the right message to the right people through the right channels at the right time. And I believe no other tool offers you that ability than, than paid media. So hopefully that answers the question. Yes, thank you so much, Panor, for that uh, detailed response. I appreciate the example, as I'm sure Lauren does as well. Uh, unfortunately, we have run out of time. Uh, but I do want to thank you again. Thank you, uh, Conrad, for your time, for sharing your expertise, for providing uh, these case studies. I also want to thank ReadyTalk for, for their partnership and also for providing us with our web conferencing platform uh, today. Uh, and, of course, thank you so much to our audience for, for your time and your participation. Um, I do want to remind you that this webcast will be archived on ama.org slash webcast later on this afternoon, so please uh, be sure to uh, check that out if you want to reference any of these points. And if we did not have a chance to get to your question, we will uh, come up with a plan to continue the conversation offline. So thank you so much, everyone, again, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.